Good morning, everybody. And it's going to rain today. Yes. A uh, few announcements. So the children's plate, the wooden plate, uh, for the, these two months is going to be for uh, vacation Bible camp and youth group expenses. Today, the women were asked to remain after the service to practice for the choir for Father's Day. That'll be a treat. We also have a very good lunch coming up on June 24, and June 24 is coming up surprisingly fast. Two settings at 11.30 and 1. Talk to Bernice or Lady Aid members uh, for more info. We have a Ladies' Day out on June 26, also coming up. The reservation is for 12.15. It's at South Coat 53. Uh, Donna or Catherine have more info, and if you could RSVP as soon as possible, that would help them plan. Uh, we're having a vacation Bible camp again this year, at VBC. Uh, registration's open now. Forms are available. You can also talk to Shelley Udall about that or uh, respond to Shelley's email at shelley.udall at gmail.com or give her a call. A VBC committee is looking for help uh, <laughs> for uh, props. It's a river uh, running ideas, so life jackets, paddles, all that kind of thing. And uh, Catherine was good enough on the announcements to send out a notice about a congregational meeting. Uh, so we didn't have a printed offer today, but if you get the email version, you'll notice there's an email about a congregational meeting two weeks from today, so mark your calendars. That'll be June 25, right after the service at 1030. So this is good news. It's uh, about planning for some improvements around the church, and it's above budget amount, but we talk, developed our budget at the annual meeting. This is above our budget amount, and so we need a congregational meeting to talk and decide is this the right thing to do or not. And so we're calling this meeting for June 25. The board is moving a quotation from JX Contracting be accepted by the congregation to fix retaining walls uh, around this side over here. The um, railway ties that are there right now are rotten, so it would be to repair that. It would be to put sidewalks, new sidewalks around the side here and then to grade the parking lot and, and restone it so that it drains way better. You'll notice we've got a pylon over here where we've got some stones out of place and we had some puddling problems. So the goal would be to fix the sidewalk, to eliminate some of the trip hazard, to fix some of the paving stone, to grade the driveway and fix that retaining wall. So it does cost a fair bit of money and that's why the annual meeting so just a ballpark, uh, sidewalks $23,780, uh, no wait, that was the budget for last year to do some repairs downstairs and we saved some money on that or the uh, board was able to save some money on that. So that will help on uh, being able to fund this, but that doesn't automatically carry to this year's budget. So we still need to chat about this and it will require more. The actual proposal itself, the concrete walkways are 12.5. Regrading the parking lot, 750. Concrete block retaining walls, 7,500. And then PVCIP piping to drain away the water, $600. And then some extra money for fixing the, replacing the trees out here and laying gravel, so about 5,600 for that. Total, $28,786. So it is a bit of money. That's why we want you a couple of weeks to think about it. If you do have the email version, you can look at it, study it at home, read it tonight, lots of fun. And think about it for two weeks, have a look around. Uh, board of Managers people, put your hand up if you're Board of Managers. We've got a few of them around. If you have questions, speak to one of them. All right. Uh, should be aware as well, uh, there is another project underway. We do have some bud money budget that was approved earlier. And there was some work that needed to get done. <coughs> As we all know, it's hard to get people to work on stuff. So there is a repair project already in their way to fix the bell tower and the roof on top of the bell tower. Uh, and that's going to cost a bit of money as well. That's $9,000. And that had to move along uh, because it was kind of an urgent pro project. If we didn't get it booked, we wouldn't get it done. So that's kind of chewing up the available budget right now. That's all the finances for today, unless anybody else... <laughs> Has any additional comments? All right. We Thank you. Rejoice that we're totally on track with the rest of our budget. Rest of the budget's come along very well. And we actually do have some money in a fund that's not allocated yet. So if we do this, 
there is some money available, you just have to pull them out and use it. But you can only spend money one time. So it does impact that. All right, that is the announcements and the additional announcements. Feel, feel free to read them at home. We'll have more details next week. Okay, thank you. <coughs> While we come to God thirsty and hungry, as the deer pants for water, so my soul pants after you. So only the hungry search for bread. Only the thirsty look for water. This is a place for those who are hungry and thirsty in spirit. Only those who ache for meaning will pursue it. Only those who yearn for a deeper life will seek it. This is a place for those who ache and yearn for something more. So let us come before the Lord our God, hungry and thirsty, that he might satisfy our deepest longings. Let the Lord, the God of life, satisfy our souls. Let's come to our God in prayer. O oh God, you are our God. You are the one in whom we trust. And we gather today to worship you, to open our hearts and our minds to your presence. We long to meet you here. We hunger and thirst to hear your voice. We come this morning with confidence because Christ has laid a path. And because we've met you here before and have been awed and inspired by your glory and your power. We come with gratitude because we know your steadfast love, a love which is better than life itself. We come with confidence because of what Christ has done and because we've met you here before. And so we offer our confessions and we invite your spirit to convict us, to lead us on the path of repentance and to turn our hearts around. We come with confidence because we have received your grace. And so we praise you, lifting up our voices and lifting up our hands in joy and expectation. Pour out your spirit on our thirsty souls that we may be filled with your goodness and love. Hear us, O oh Father, as we now sing the Lord's Prayer. People of God, this is the confidence that we have from Jesus Christ, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Let's respond in that um, assurance of Christ as we sing. I heard the Je voice of Jesus say as he invites us further um, into his presence. Let's stand and sing.
Let's continue our worship by offering our gifts. The first plate is for the work and ministry of this church as we reach out to uh, the world and locally. And the second plate is uh, for our children as noted in the bulletin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the generosity of your people as your spirit works in all of our hearts. 
We thank you, O oh God, that you have placed a love in our hearts to meet the needs of all those who physically hunger and thirst and those who spiritually hunger and thirst. And so we pray, Father, would you bless these gifts and multiply them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I found an old gift from my grandmother in Holland sitting in a closet the other day, and so I pulled it out, and it had me thinking about a children's story this morning about what's fair and balancing that out. And there's a story in the Bible of a lady who just maybe didn't have a very good life. And we don't really know if it was because she was sinful or if life just didn't treat her fairly, but she was from Samaria. And she's called in the Bible the Samaritan woman. And the Jews don't like Samaritans. And not only the Jews, but even her own friends. And so they would kind of say mean things to her. And when you say mean things about someone else or cut them down, you elevate yourself. And that's not the way that Jesus wanted things to be, right? You're not more important than another person, right? And so what do you think might balance the scale? Instead of saying mean things to a person and elevating ourselves, we might equally understand that we are broken and encourage them, and then we're equal. Jesus calls some of right living and right doing and the way that we talk about other people or the way that we take care of the earth, all those things is about right living, righteousness, and he's looking for a balance between the two. Now, some things are a lot worse than others, like wars. Wars cause a lot of pain, a lot of death, a lot of suffering. But we can also trust that even though that seems really unbalanced, that certain countries or certain people as a whole people group elevate themselves above others, we know that Jesus died on the cross and that he is making all things right. And we see it little bits at a time. And so Jesus, when he died gives righteousness. It's a gift. Not because we deserve it. Not because we did everything perfectly good. Not because we said everything was perfectly good. But because when we believe on him and ask for forgiveness, he gives us, it says in the Bible, clothes of righteousness. In other words, he gives us a desire to live rightly. So this is not only what Christ has done for us, but what also we strive to do as God's people. To never elevate ourselves, but to seek right living and fairness as best as we can. Shall we pray about that? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ that gives us robes of righteousness. And we're so grateful for that because we know that we didn't deserve for you to call us good people. We're so broken. But at the same time, Lord, because you have forgiven us and you have come to us with such love that we really, really, really want to try our best to live right. So we pray, help us, Lord, to be kind to everyone, to love people as you love them, to seek fairness and righteousness and good things that everyone can have food and clothing and shelter and love and care. And we pray that you would help us do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Miss Catherine will be... Oh, no, we have our, uh, our Beatitudes song on video this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who see, 
Catherine's going to do Sunday school with you this morning. We're continuing the Beatitudes and we're looking this morning at uh, Matthew 5, verse 6 where Jesus continues speaking on the Sermon of the Mount, where he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. My kids grew up reading a number of book series, one of which was The Hunger Games. I don't know, are any of you familiar with The Hunger Games? It's it's a series that was released in 2008 telling the story of a global catastrophe in which a a new world government is formed. And that government has all the resources. And it leaves the rest of humanity in a perpetual state of hunger. Now, the government creates contests for entertainment, a little bit like a sporting in the old Colosseum in the gladiator games. 
except they use young people who annually are called and challenged to fight to the death, and if they win, their particular district of people receive gifts, especially food. And so the districts cheer on their young representative, and they can watch them because there's cameras all over the world. And they cheer on to the death because if their young person wins, they will be satisfied. And then there's young Katniss, the star of the show, the young person who challenges the whole system. Hunger drives people. Even if we read the papers today, we, we see how many environmental refugees there are because there isn't enough um, fertile soil to grow good food and thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people have had to leave areas in search of life-sustaining food, fighting to stay alive. This is at the heart of what Jesus' message is saying. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Jesus is speaking of those he knows that cannot live unless they find righteousness. In Psalm 63, we hear the desperate cry, O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. It is a deep, deep hunger and thirst, not only for God, but for righteousness or right living. There are those who show that they have been grabbed by the gospel of Jesus Christ because they hunger and thirst after righteousness. <laughs> Jesus' challenge here cannot be underestimated. To be righteous is the Christian point of decision that will demand change. This is a change that will feel as if it is sacrificial as we do God's will and live by God's will. And it's not comfortable. See, because in a few weeks, we're going to look at verse 10 that says, Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for doing right things. Our culture considers right living inconsequential. It's none of my business what that person does. Go ahead, live the way you want. No big deal. Even believers declare, well, I've been saved by grace, so I can keep on living the way that I want. Justifying and giving a license to excuse immorality or poor decisions. Do we remember this? Can this set in our hearts that God came to us and loved us? He offered his grace, but our gratitude is the point in which we respond to live for Christ. Gratitude, according to Scripture, is the way in which we give our thanks and praise to God, not only with lip service, but in the way that we live to turn our lives around under the will of God. And Jesus says, when you do that, when you seek righteousness, you will be satisfied. Well, looking for satisfaction is also a pursuit and goal of many people in this culture. People posting on Instagram and Facebook or doing their little TikToks. And they, they put up all these little memes or quotes. Things like, every morning makes the biggest decision, pardon me, every morning make the biggest decision of your life. Live for today. Or carpe diem, seize the day giving little thought to yesterday or the day ahead. You see, many, including ourselves, seek instant gratification to fill our immediate hungers and thirsts, but it leaves us wanting more. And as Christians particularly, it's kind of sad how we desire less. Jesus offered the more, saying, if you come to me, you will be satisfied. In John 4, Jesus explains to the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. So the question 
that we might consider is, if you know that Jesus will satisfy your hunger and your thirst, would you not pursue him until he delivers it, until he meets that need? Would you not cry out to him as the psalmist show us again and again? Show us your kingdom, Lord. Satisfy our hunger. Turn this world upside down. To live for God in every manner of life and drawing close to him every day, reading scripture and reading. You see, as your pastor, I can't satisfy your hunger and thirst in a short message on Sunday mornings. Only God can and will do that as you daily seek him. You see, the outcome is that we will be satisfied with God and we will become more dissatisfied with the substitutes of instant gratification. So what does hungering and thirsting for righteousness look like? Well, first we need to recognize there's a distortion of righteousness in our own lives. Sin. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the righteous, because we're all going to fall short. You see, that's where his grace comes in, and it's extended for all people long before anyone is righteous. So no one is blessed because they are righteous. Rather, in following Jesus, his disciples, you and I become so dissatisfied with our shortcomings that we can continuously pursue holy living, that we continuously look at our lives and confess and repent and turn around. Ambrose was a theologian just 200 years after Christ, about, and he says, as soon as I wept for my sin, I began to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's in acknowledging our sin that we long and desire to live rightly. You see, Jesus doesn't yank us into obedience and hard, you you know, using guilt tactics, obey or else. Rather, he provides a path and a guidance to live righteously according to God's will because he desires a right, related relationship. It's our gratitude toward what God has done for us that calls us into obedience. And that's still a choice that you and I need to make. Second, the distortion of righteousness is evident in the whole world. It's not our shortcomings alone that we hunger and thirst to see made right, but also the pain of injustice and the inequities in the world that actually start to grieve us. I don't know about you, but I become disheartened watching the news. Increased viruses, strange illness, Guns made at home with 3D printers right here in Hamilton. Zigzaggedy, speedy road racers who cut me off on Highway 56 as I drive to Benbrook. Children increasingly being seized from unfit parents. I find myself complaining continuously. The world is so evil. It's so wrong. But then I also find myself grabbed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not satisfied with the way things are. I'm also not satisfied in idealizing it could be better or as just a luxury or a distant hope that God is going to redeem. I'm, I'm deeply pained and driven by the absolute necessity for righteousness to be in the here and now, God's kingdom on earth now as it is in heaven. So right living does turn things around. It's to be driven to our knees and seeking the name of Jesus Christ and by his grace and his miracles and his faithful assurance that he is not going to, he is redeeming all things. And we're driven to pray in humility and willingness to let the work be done in and through us. That too is a choice and not an easy one. Have you been grabbed by the gospel of Jesus Christ to mourn the unrighteousness in your life and in the world? That point of decision demands a sacrificial change to live by the will and the grace of Jesus Christ. A third, Jesus says when we seek these things, we will be satisfied. 
When we grieve the brokenness and the unrighteousness in this world, we will witness satisfying deliverance. This is what he promises. We begin and long for and will pursue those things for which we were made. You see, Jesus heals the cravings that the power of sin has distorted and, and twisted. And he satisfies us. So that longing for kingdom righteousness delivers actual hunger from compulsive overeating. Or sexual intimacy is healed from lustful obsession. Or the longing of greatness is delivered from ego centrality. It's panting as the deer thirsts for water by running to the river of life, Jesus Christ. It's there that we find we're healed and delivered and how Jesus reforms our appetites and moves us more and more into living for God. We can, we can say things like, I just follow Jesus. The question is, will we? Seek after righteousness in all things. See, it's more than just head knowledge. It's the doing of living the Christian faith and the doing and living in the will of Jesus Christ. It's incredibly challenging. And righteousness, of course, is mostly about right relatedness. All things that are wrong with the world is because there's tension between different relationships. And it's especially about our relationship with God our relationship with other human beings. It's, it's in relationship to our environment. Again, it's, it's not about standards or rules. Even the Ten Commandments are prefixed with the idea of relationship, relationship. As God comes in and he says, I am your God, you are my people. Even the commandments start with solidifying the relationship. And the Ten Commandments then point us to, a, to what this right relatedness looks like. If there is one thing we might come to understand, it's that disobedience itself is not so grievous because a code of ethics has been violated, but because our relationship with God, with others, our environment has been broken. When we sin, there's a disconnect with all of those, and it's severing. The Beatitudes keep asking us the question, have we been grabbed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because as we have been saying along the way, blessed, blessed are you, you lucky bums, because you know that we cannot live unless we find right relatedness in our relationships because God then will satisfy. In the gospel, righteousness breaks through again and again. It's what Jesus came to do on earth as it is in heaven. And that God is righteousing all of our unchecked relationships. That through Christ Jesus, God is repairing relationships between himself and others in the earth. That the righteousness of God will bring justice vindication, and mercy as God determines to right evil and offer his grace. Our assurance this morning is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he has conquered evil. It is finished. And we talked about that before over Easter. As God's guarantee that he will bring all things into completion, and he's working on it even now. So all you who follow Christ's hunger and thirst for righteousness because it's time. Chew on right living this week as you seek the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. It's time for God's vision for the kingdom of light to break into darkness, the kingdom of justice to break into oppression, the kingdom of life to invade those spaces of death. See, for those who hunger and thirst for God's kingdom of righteousness, they will be satisfied. That is the words of grace from Jesus Christ. And may we live into them this week. Amen.
a lot of right living comes with the way that God's Spirit moves in our hearts as we carry others on our hearts and in our lives and as we minister to each other. And it's also about knowing this relationship that we have with God where we can come to him and seek him in prayer. And so I invite you to give shape to our prayer this this morning if there is anything of joy that you would like to share or anything of concern that we can pray for, I invite your input. Let's come to God in prayer. Holy God, from the very beginning of creation, you brought in living water. It flows from your throne and it reaches out into all the earth, giving life-sustaining, quenching thirst. We pray for those this morning, Lord, who are thirsting spiritually. It might even be me. It might be someone here. It might be someone online. For those who long to know your presence but don't know where to find you. We pray for those who are alone and without hope. For those who long to feel needed and loved. For those who are searching for meaning and purpose. O oh, living bread, quenching water, satisfy us, we pray. We pray for those who are physically thirsty, who do not have enough water or food to drink, environmental refugees who are looking for the basic needs of life. We pray, Lord, with, uh, or we give thanks, Lord, for the rain this morning, for a parched land that was thirsty to be fed so that it might produce crop and flowers and grass for us to enjoy and to feed us. We pray for those who have to be content with water that is unclean and who suffer illnesses that come from those waters. And so we thank you, O oh God, that through such agencies as Presbyterian Sharing and Presbyterian World Service and Development, that we are able to live righteously through our gifts and seek justice for those who do not have what they need, and that we can reach out with food and water for our physical sustenance. O oh, living bread and healing river, our Lord Jesus Christ, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray this morning for our young families and students who are in school as final papers come due and exams and projects. As we walk into the last couple of weeks of education before a summer break, we pray that it may be a blessing for all. We pray for those children and students that are traveling for class trips. Would you protect them and keep them safe? We pray for those, Lord, who are hungry and thirsty for justice. We cannot even name all the wars that are taking place, whether they are for land or with gangs or whether there's fights over food or ethnicity. We pray for a equal sharing of resources among peoples and nations and those who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans and those who are working to create clean water. God, you know that so many of us have things and people and situations on our hearts this morning. And even though we don't share them publicly, we just lay them before you. As our hearts ache for those who don't know you. As our bodies ache with pain, we seek your healing. As we undergo tests and are filled with fear, we pray for your living water to bring peace. When we hear of those in 
hospice care or with serious illness. We pray that they may be satisfied with your food and we pray for healing. For situations where there isn't a right relatedness, where relationships are tense, whether that be with a spouse, a child, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker. All these things we lift to you. And Father, we pray then as your people, who have been clothed with robes of righteousness by your grace, may live righteously for equity and justice. O living bread, healing river, Pour down your waters and heal your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of I Hunger and Thirst. For you who have received robes of righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ, go out into all the world, teaching his gospel and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.